Hello and welcome to the Extreme Perspectives podcast. We bring you conversations with people who see things differently and think differently. Innovators, outliers, misfits, rebels, and the crazy ones from the Sense Network. I'm your host, Jeremy Brown. I seek out people at the edges of culture who are creating the future. People who want to change things and push the human race forward. Together, we collaborate with some of the world's most innovative companies to help them be more innovative. Today, we are speaking with the rebel, artist, filmmaker, and photographer, Ricardo Scipio. Keep listening as we discuss the evolution of photography, sexual art, society's angst, body positivity, the moral immaturity of big tech, and sexual expression, and how porn is like junk food, and why we need something more wholesome. Hi, Ricardo. How are you? Hi, Jeremy. I'm good. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well. I am so pleased that we are getting some time to talk together because it's been a long time since we first met. And I'm sure you've been on a hell of a journey since we last had a proper conversation. But as always, before I get started and before we hear that, I'm going to open with the question. Are you an outlier, misfit, rebel, or a crazy one? <laughs> That's an easy question for me to answer. I'm a rebel. <laughs> Born one, always been one. My heroes have always been rebels. Um, yeah, the revolution will not be televised. It's going to be podcast. Excellent. So we've got a Gil Scott Heron quote straight off the bat. Um, so tell it, I mean, just, I think it's important that um, we at least, even though we've known each other a long time, we haven't um, had a lot of conversations like this since we first met in New York back in about 1998, 1999, something like that, when you were down at the Filmmakers Cooperative. I think it was on Green Street back then. Yeah, the Filmmakers Collaborative on 29 Green Street. Yes, those were the days. <laughs> and uh, so it would be great talking about being a rebel, talking a little bit about your journey before we maybe met and since we met, uh, and then kind of let's see where that takes us. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll start with, I'll start yeah, at the beginning. Um, so it's almost like a David Copperfield kind of thing, but uh, I'll start at the beginning. I was born in 1969 in Trinidad. I, uh, theoretically was not supposed to make it. I was born two months premature. I was only four pounds. The doctors told my mom not to touch me. They didn't want her getting attached to me because they're convinced I wasn't gonna make it. And uh, I was in the hospital for a month in incubator and oxygen tent and all that stuff, but I made it. Um, so I was born 1969 in Trinidad. And, uh, you know, had, you know, beautiful childhood memories of idyllic life in, in Trinidad in the late 60s. And um, then my parents uh, yanked me up and brought me to the great white north of Canada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, my first memory of Canada was landing in Montreal on April Fool's Day, April 1st. Um, and it was snowing. And we didn't have coats because we thought April was spring. <laughs> And uh, the stewardesses, um, and I think um, one of the pilots gave us their coats, uh, which was extraordinary. But I uh, arrived in Canada and um, was a little skinny, shy, you know, black kid with a very funny accent. And immediately from day one, uh, the little white children would like beat the shit out of me every day. <laughs> and introduced me to a uniquely Canadian institution called a snow job. I don't know if you know, you guys know what a snow job is. That's a new one on me. Well, that's when they sort of attack you with snow. They push you into the snow and they put snow down your pants and snow in your nose and snow down your mouth and snow in your ears and snow anywhere they could get. It. It's called a snow job. It's a Canadian thing. <laughs> so that was my introduction to uh, Canada. You know, I grew up in, uh, in Toronto, um, 
a very multicultural city. And despite being bullied, um, it was actually, you know, a good childhood because I had friends from all over the world. I had Armenian friends, friends from India, friends from Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Um, so it was, you know, a great sort of way of just traveling around the world without leaving your neighborhood. Um, there were very few kids by that time that were native born Canadians. They're all mostly immigrants. So uh, it was very cool. And uh, Canada, like England, has a good public education system. So um, went to good schools and in Canada, no matter how poor you are, and we were quite poor, um, you can go to university if you've got the grades. So, you know, I was able to go to the best art school in Canada and, um, you know, have a, have a good education that way. Much to my mom's horror, who always wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, because I, you know, was fairly smart in school. I decided at 18, being the rebel, uh, to become an artist. And so went to art school instead of medical school. After uh, going to art school, I had to figure out how do you survive, you know, being an artist. And of all the things I was interested in, which was painting and writing and photography, photography seemed the only thing that um, was a good bet to actually make a living at, because I figured no matter what, sooner or later, someone will pay you for some sort of photograph in some way. So I, at 20 years old, became a fashion photographer and uh, was photographing models and doing that whole thing. It was ever changing because no matter what um, was going on, six months later, something else completely different was going on. And that made photographs very disposable because no matter how great your image was, no one cares in six months because the styles have changed. But it also stops you from being stuck in any kind of rut. You can't be. You have to always be looking for different ways of seeing, different ways of presenting. And it, you get paid by the hours. You have to learn how to shoot very quickly. And you're most of the time shooting on location. So you had to develop the ability to just show up anywhere, size it up quickly and figure out how to shoot it and make it work. Constantly shooting with new people. Um, so you had to learn a lot about psychology because you had to learn how to sort of break the ice with people and create a space where they feel empowered and able to you know, do their thing. It was mostly populated on my side of things by gay men. So it was a, an interesting introduction to gay culture. Unfortunately, soon after I started my photography career, the AIDS epidemic uh, started hitting really hard. And as a young person, you know, being in my early 20s, seeing people in their 20s and 30s die, and you know, some of them die within months, uh, was pretty, uh, uh, I don't know how to even describe it. It was uh, like something biblical you know, some sort of Armageddon, end of the world kind of thing. And we, no one sort of knew why it was happening and, you know, how far it would, you know, reach into society. So no one really felt safe. And so um, that was sort of my life in the late 80s and early 90s. And after a while, I sort of got tired of making disposable images. And I think I was a bit burnt out by so many of my friends dying and such. And I was searching around for something different to do. And I decided to pursue uh, becoming a film director. So I went to New York City, <laughs> only me. Um, yeah. Went to New York City with $300 in my pocket, only knew one person, said that I was gonna stay for a couple of weeks, asked if I could stay for a couple of weeks at her place, ended up staying six years and um, had no money, um, never went to film school, didn't have enough money. At the time, it was $1.50 to get on the subway. Didn't even have that. Couldn't go to meetings, didn't have subway fare. So luckily, the internet had just sort of started rolling at that point. Um, and I just thought, okay, if I can't go to meetings, I will just email anyone in New York City connected with the film industry and see if you know, I could make some headway that way. So I literally just emailed everyone in New York who um, was connected with film and most of them would email back and say, how did you get my email address? Fuck off, don't contact me again. 
<laughs> but you know, a few were sort of intrigued and they were like, oh, you want to make a film? You know, tell us, you know, tell us more about it and whatever. And I luckily crossed paths with some young investment bankers that were bored and sort of were intrigued by this guy that came from nowhere and wanted to make a film. So they talked to me on the phone. And the first thing I told them was, if you're looking for a good investment, stay away from film. It's a bad investment. <laughs> um, but if you're wanting to hang out on set and see how a film is made and go to parties and be involved you know, in a project from start to finish, I can guarantee you that. I can guarantee you we won't steal your money or you know, throw it away on rubbish. You know, we'll, we'll spend it actually on making the film. But that's basically all I can guarantee. And they were uh, impressed because for years, all these young hustlers were telling them they're gonna make back five times their money or something on a, on a film. And they're like, we're investment bankers, we're not stupid. <laughs> you know, we, we know that's not a reality. And they said, I was the first person that didn't prop make all these grandiose promises. So they were intrigued, but still skeptical. So they gave me $10,000 and they said, show us what you can do with $10,000 and started developing the project. Because mind you, when I crossed paths with them, I didn't even have a full script written yet. And they're, you know, they were happy with what I did with the 10,000. So they gave me 25,000 more, you know, I developed it further and they were impressed and they then said, okay, we'll give you a hundred thousand more. You know, I did more. And by that time they said, okay, we've spent too much money. We can't go back now. We, we have to finish this thing now. So they ended up in total giving $780,000 in 1997 dollars, which was a, a lot of money I thought at the time. And uh, yeah, I made my first film in New York. Besides using the internet to meet people, the smartest thing I did at that time was just have parties. We had 13 parties for that film. You know, it made a bit of a buzz and it sort of, I don't know, it created a momentum for the project, just having these parties. And at that time in New York, we would just call up bars and restaurants, whatever, and they would say, hey, we want to cultivate a filmmaking crowd. So we'll give you two hours of open bar. We'll give you hors d'oeuvres blah, blah, blah. We had a rooftop party where like Tanqueray gave us boxes of gin and vodka. Uh, Grand Marnier gave us boxes of Grand Marnier. They brought servers to serve it. They gave us tables, tablecloths, the whole nine yards. We had this great party and we had so much alcohol left over that I had boxes stored under my desk at the Filmmakers Collaborative for months. And we were like, how are we gonna drink all this alcohol? <laughs> Those were kind of the days in, in New York. So I, I made a film, you know, from 97 to 99. Then I made my second one from 98 to 2000. So, but um, I was just so, sorry to interrupt. That's amazing. But there are a few things that I think were really fascinating. And I think it's just worth focusing on is that kind of you making a decision not to do med school and to do something creative and asking yourself that question, will this idea feed me? It's that whole thing around, if you're gonna do something, that's the ultimate test. Will this idea feed me? And I, and I really love that. And that's kind of, I don't think people often ask that question enough, but sometimes they do it anyway. And I remember that was one of the reasons why we connected because we were both looking at the possibilities of the internet and these, because it, it was still like the wild west then. Oh yeah. You know, people that would converse with you who are complete strangers, this was like, I think that's why we connected actually. We found each other in the ether and we both were fascinated by the possibilities. And there was you going, the possibilities of being able to make a film and never meet anyone else physically that you actually made that film with. So you had someone editing it for you in LA whilst you were directing it there in uh, New York. But the question I had to ask, and I'm sure anyone listening will be intrigued to know, what with the films that you were making, what was the what was the subject? What was just tell us a little bit more about the projects themselves? Sure, um, I the poor unfortunate woman who's who I said I was staying for two weeks and ended up staying six years uh, was an actress, and I saw her life and you know what it was like to be a struggling actor in New York, so I decided to make a tragic comedy about five struggling actresses in New York. Um, and so that was the, the first film. And it was pretty crazy. <laughs> there was a thriving, I think still is, a thriving sort of underground art and performance scene in New York, especially on the Lower East Side, especially like in Alphabet City and stuff. We incorporated a lot of local 
uh, New York characters. In fact, my uh, producer um, created a new word. Um, we call them sub-liberties. <laughs> and, uh, and there were just so many of these New York characters that you had to, you know, be a New Yorker and sort of in the, you know, avant-garde kind of scene to really know who they were. But for those people, they were like legendary and whatever. So uh, we just got all these crazy New York characters in, into the film and we got all kinds of other people. Like we got Fabrice uh, Morvan, who is the surviving member of Millie Vanilli. He was in it. Uh, you Brits would know downtown Julie Brown, I think, um, from MTV fame. We had her in it and Mackenzie Phillips, um, the daughter of John Phillips from the mothers, Mamas and Papas and star of the show called One Day at a Time. She was in it and we just had lots of uh, characters in it. So that was the first one. And then um, I made a second um, one, which was a sort of a, a dysfunctional New York love story. It was about uh, two people that had a one night stand and never expected to see each other again. And the woman got pregnant from the one night stand. So they spent time sort of just figuring out what to do with each other and having a, you know, a downtown New York love story happen out of that. Um, and both those films uh, starred my roommate. Um, so she did get something out of letting me stay at her place, but yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And so we got to 2001, September the 11th, stock market crash. Where from there? Well, yeah, I was developing a, a movie. I was going to make a movie about the porn industry and no one wanted to invest. Um, and it was just a bad time. It was the war on terror beginning and New York was crazy at the time. Um, if people don't remember in that month of September, you know, 2001, not only was there the World Trade Center bombing, but there was a white supremacist mailing anthrax in the mail. So yep. like three people in New York died from the mail. So you're like scared even of your mail. And, um, and then we had a, a 747 crash at JFK airport and everyone aboard died. So all of that in one month. So it was pretty crazy. And just other things were going on, like people were really on edge. So you were afraid of going to subway afraid of bridges, just afraid of just all kinds of things. So I decided, you know, I'm going to, you know, return to Canada. So oh, there's a couple of things I thought was interesting. You made the switch from photography to film and photography is one of those things as well in the last 20 years, which has changed radically. We've kind of moved from, you know, amazing cameras becoming more compact and more better and now embedding them in phones and how I actually think the entire art of photography is kind of changed as well from sort of composition to editing. You've sort of actually seen this big shift take place. It's in more people's hands. There are more images around us. And what was, you know, the, the precious images that you talked about being sort of six months fashion cycles and the imagery coming through that has just totally accelerated and you know and has the role of the photographer changed yeah that's great questions first of all i think um there's almost no such thing as a photographer anymore um the the, the profession is in some ways almost dead and it's you know quite a bit different than when i started i, I started in 86 you know back then you had a dark room and you spent countless hours in the dark room doing your alchemy and uh, it was kind of mysterious and, and sexy and you'd go to a party and people would ask you what you do and and um, and when you say you're a photographer it'd be like ooh, you know it's almost like being a rock star um, it's like wow you know i wish i could do that that sounds pretty exotic or whatever blah 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 now if you go to a party and say you're a photographer the only question is what do you really do <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's, your, what's your real gig? Come on, you know. Um, no, it's it's changed tremendously, um, and in some ways, much for the much better, um, and in some ways, to its almost complete demise. Photography has always been, I think, the most democratic of the visual arts. Um, for one, you don't have to be born with some like magic manual dexterity that allows you to draw and paint like you know, like some Renaissance master or something. Anyone, 
you know, can push a button and, you know, make that machine work. Um, but secondly, photography is one of the newest uh, visual media. And because of that, there wasn't like some long entrenched history with long entrenched rules that you had to follow. It, you know, it was pretty new. And unlike other art forms, most of the advances in photography have been made by amateurs, not by professionals. And that's been that way since day one. So originally with photography, photography was just a cheaper way of making a painting. Actually, when photographs first started, you photograph people on a painted background and you'd have clamps that you'd clamp on their necks so they couldn't move. <laughs> and, you know, and you would take the photo and it was very stiff. And, but, it, you know, when they started inventing smaller cameras that you could actually carry with you, and amateurs started getting those cameras into their hands, they started doing weird things with the cameras, weird angles, weird compositions, photographing things that weren't considered the kind of things you would photograph um, before, you know, candid photos of your pets and children and picnics and all that kind of stuff. And that really changed it. And then when photojournalists got their hands on it, that completely changed it as well. You know, it was a way of, of showing us the world. So it was always democratic. Um, women participated in, in photography in a pretty wide way from day one, which was not true of many other art forms. Uh, people of all different ethnicities and races and whatever have always um, participated in photography. It was, you know, it was very democratic that way. And it's become more so now with digital, um, there are no barriers. Um, my eight-year-old takes pretty good photos and she loves taking photos. I give her photo assignments. I'll, you know, I'll say, you know, make me 15 images that portray the, the quality of strength. And she'll just go around and, you know, do that. And she's been taking photos, of, I think at least from, from the time she was like three years old, she's been taking photos already. And I just thought, wow, if there were digital cameras when I was a kid, <laughs> I can only imagine what the possibilities would have been like for me. So I'm excited that people have this tool in, in their hands. So that's, you know, so it's even more democratic than ever. Unfortunately though, it's more disposable than ever. Uh, it's, it, it's not precious anymore. Like before the photographer had the negatives and the photographer could decide how many prints of something were made. So there was a lot of control and it was, you know, largely in the creator's hands. Now, um, anything that's posted on the internet, anyone could download and, and edit and, and whatever. It's, it's there for everyone to, to use. Because there's no dark rooms and no negatives per se anymore, um, the public perception, I think, of photographs are that they don't have a lot of value. They're just sort of eye candy. You can go on Instagram and spend all day <laughs> seeing more photos than you'll ever want to see. And Instagram itself has changed sort of the way people look at photos and take photos, even just by the fact that it's like a square format. It's not even the, the normal format of a, uh, that photos have traditionally been. It's you know, a completely new day uh, for photography and it's a, it's a big struggle. There are people that wouldn't blink at paying $20,000, $30,000 for a painting, but ask them to pay even $1,000 for a photograph. Yeah. It's, a it's a tough sell. Yeah. I, you know, my last book has 183 photos in it and it costs $500. And there's, it's a limited edition. You know, there's only 300 copies of it. And people are telling me that $500 is too expensive for 183 color photos. Yeah, those perceptions of values, it's, it's very strange, isn't it? And uh, well, I guess the role that technology plays, and it just got me thinking as you were talking about that evolution of technology, um, and you mentioned the film that you were working on, you were, you were starting to look at the porn industry. And I know that that's something that's kind of featured really heavily in your work. But I was just thinking, often when we look at innovation, for a long time, I used the porn industry as a great example of those early adopters, because there was that relationship with, you know, that democratization of the image from sort of home movie cameras videos and then the distribution of vcrs that was really what you saw the explosion of the the porn industry and then you also had the internet which allowed them to distribute it 
even further afield from that as well. So I was just actually thinking, well, where does that go next? And actually some of what you've been talking about in terms of photography probably plays along your sort of storyline in how you started to kind of, excuse the uh, filmmaking pun, but focus in on um, looking at the porn industry specifically. So I was just sort of going to segue across there a little bit. And maybe you kind of want to pick that up and sort of talk about your more recent projects. Sure. Um, after um, after returning to Canada, I needed some time to heal. I was, pr I was pretty traumatized. And so I spent some time living in the woods, <laughs> which was good for me. When I started feeling like myself again, I wanted to return to being a photographer. I still did make one more film, but most of my recent time, most of my last 19 years of been being a photographer, I wanted to return to it because I love filmmaking, but it requires so many resources, dozens of people working on it, lots of money. You know, you're dependent on distributors, and film festivals, and all that kind of stuff. There's a real simplicity and intimacy with photography where I could call you up on the phone and say, hey, can I come over and take your photo? And I can do it and no one can stop us and no one needs to finance us and no one needs to distribute us. Um, my books, my first book that I put out in 2005, I had a publisher, but since then I've been self-publishing. So I've been able to do what I want when I, when I want it, which was, which was really great. And photography is my first love. I mean, I started taking photos when I was 14, so I missed it and I went back to it. But, um, you know, I wasn't gonna go back to being a fashion photographer. That wasn't gonna be satisfying. So I decided, you know, what's the opposite of being a fashion photographer? And that was, you know, being a nude photographer, not having clothes, not having people be in hair and makeup for three hours before you shoot. And so I started photographing both men and women at first, but then I mostly started focusing on, on women. I started shooting women of all different shapes and sizes and colors and ages um, in color in natural landscapes. And I called it my goddess projects. And I did three books of that uh, from 2002 to, um, to 2013. But um, <laughs> something strange happened. Um, one day I was photographing a 70 year old artist in the woods and it was just our normal nude shoot. And in the middle of the shoot without warning and <laughs> unexpected, totally unexpected by me, she started masturbating in the middle of the shoot. And I, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept shooting and we didn't talk about it afterwards. And I was like, wow, that was really random and strange, but okay. Um, I just carried on. And then shortly after that, the same thing happened with a 53 year old. And I was like, okay, I've got to think about this. And I started talking to the people that I'd been photographing and they, had, they were telling me that, you know, they wanted to express themselves more sexually, but that I wouldn't let them. I'd, I'd been kind of adamant that I wanted to keep my work um, non-sexual. I didn't want to be compared to porn. I didn't want, you know, all the backlash that would come with that. And so I try to keep it uh, non-sexual. And even just doing nudes, you have to deal with a lot of society's angst about nudity and, and sex. So even doing nudes is not easy. Um, so I definitely didn't want to do anything more sexual than just nudes. But when I talked to my people, I just realized I was just another, you know, sort of straight male repressing women's sexuality. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to be that person. So I had to sort of look at my comfort zone and look at what I was doing and see if I could do things differently. So I decided to do an experiment. I told my people that the next book, I would do a book of women self-pleasuring. It was great for me as a photographer because it was very challenging. It was very different than just shooting nudes. It required different kinds of cameras, different kinds of lighting, 
a different way of relating with the models than I had before. It was like starting over as a photographer. And I talked to my people after that project and they said, yes, that was satisfying in some ways for them too, but that they felt that they could have expressed themselves even further if they had a partner to work with, if they weren't just by themselves. For the next book, you can have partners, you can shoot with whoever you want. And so that's how my work evolved from fashion photography to nudes to, you know, what I'm doing currently, which is photographing people having sex. So from 2014 onwards, I've been, you know, I did, you know, my sex goddess project where I did four books of, you know, women and trans persons, you know, of all different shapes, sizes, colors, ages, um, having unapologetic, authentic, non-pornographic sex. The motto of the project is that uh, sex is too important to leave in the hands of pornographers. And I do strongly believe that. I, I strongly believe that more artists, you know, should engage in making sexual art, that we shouldn't leave the space, the public space just for pornography. If anyone wants to see images of human beings, you know, having sex, really their main option that they have available is porn, uh, which I think is pretty problematic. I, I sort of equate it to food. If the only food we had available was junk food, if we just had, you know, garbage food, um, unhealthy um, food to, to choose from, we'd be pretty malnourished. And as far as sexual images go, what we mostly just have is, is junk. We don't have a lot of healthy images of that sort made by, you know, made by artists. So I did four books of the Sex Goddess Project and finished the last book in November. And that last book was a book of people over 50. I wanted to definitely celebrate my generation. I'll be, I'll be 56 in, uh, in just over a week. And um, so that's great. And I've started a new project, uh, which, I'm, which is my intimacy project. I've just started that. And it's still a sex project, but in the Sex Goddess Project, I was very open about photographing a wide range of sexual expression. And people have sex in lots of different ways for lots of different reasons. And um, I was not there to judge or sort of tell people what to do. I never directed people. I never said, do this, do that. It was always people doing their own thing. And now I felt like I've, you know, I've done a good body of work that way. I've created four books with 689 photographs of that work. And now I'm focusing more on love. I'm wanting to photograph people that are in the love space, that are, that are making love either with themselves or with others in a way that's vulnerable and open and intimate. And that's the new challenge. I think that that's an interesting, you use the word challenge as well, because I think society now has a very tangled relationship with pornography and it is very prevalent. I'd just be intrigued to know about promoting your work, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, and we've talked about the switch from analog to digital and, you know, books or, you know, because moving this sort of content into the digital space, I'm sure it's like a complete minefield. It is. I mean, I mean, social media is particularly problematic because most social media not only is anti-sex, but it's anti-nudity. For example, I don't know of any social media that's you know there for for se for sex positive people. Um, there's some fetish places, um, but that to me is a different kind of thing. So yes, if you, for, but just purely for sex positivity, no, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. Even places that existed for that a few years ago have changed because of changes in laws in America and other places. So place, things like Tumblr, uh, Patreon, et cetera, et cetera, where I could uh, do some promoting before and, and no longer can. I've had a real tough time with Facebook and Instagram, but particularly Facebook, giving me 30 day bans, week long bans routinely. Um, and it, it just gets more and more ridiculous. So the last couple of weeks, 
they've been deleting posts that I posted like six and seven years ago. <laughs> um, and they've told me that posts where I'm just, where there is no nudity, there is no controversial photography involved. It's just me stating that I'm looking for people to photograph for my project. Um, they've told me that they now consider that sexual solic solicitation, that they basically consider it me being a prostitute soliciting you know, clients or something by me, you know, just putting casting notices out saying that I'm looking for people to photograph. It's just totally random because sometimes they will take down a post, I'll, I'll protest and they'll review it and they'll put it back on and say they've made a mistake. And then like three days later, they'll take down the same post that I've posted somewhere else, but it's the exact same post and I'll protest it and review it and they'll say no. Uh, it does go against the community standards. You know, social media is, is difficult, but sort of everywhere is difficult. Um, there, you know, really isn't a consistent space out there in, in, in the public realm for someone like me, because as soon as you're dealing with, with sex, you're immediately put in the same category as pornography. And there isn't normally a distinction made between sexual art and pornography. Yeah, and I, well, that I think is a lot of the moral dilemma that you sort of see with uh, a lot of the Silicon Valley firms now. And I do think that there is a moral immaturity that exists there or being able to make uh, a call on what is art and what is not. And I, well, that will, that, that, that debate rate continues anyway. But even when you start to look at what else happens? I think, um, was there a French professor that yes. went to the Supreme Court arguing over, do you know that story? I, yeah, I don't know the details per se, but um, yeah, there was a French uh, professor who posted a 150 year old painting, uh, which was yeah. a partial nude on Facebook and Facebook uh, deleted his account. And um, he went to you know, the highest court in France and, took, and, and prevailed against Facebook, but it took him going to the highest court in France to do that. And mind you, this was not a, a photograph. This was a 150 year old painting. <laughs> this is France. So we're dealing with, you know, you, you know, what the community standards are in France. And I don't think in France that you're scandalized by partially nude 150 year old paintings, but somehow Facebook decided this was against the community standards of France. Um, and, uh, you know, got, got their knuckles wrapped for doing that. Yeah, so much for the libertine um, sort of spirit. Yeah, definitely. So much yeah. for that. So you tread quite a fine line. And do you, I mean, do you, have, do you have critics for your work? I mean, I was just trying to understand sort of, you know, you've, you're sort of being banned on one side, and I think I completely understand what, the, the sex positive space that you've sort of carved out and, and where you work. But if you've got other detractors, are there other, are there other people sort of waving their arms about at you or, or how, you know, how, how generally is the, is the reaction? What do you, what do you normally sort of, I, I'm trying to think about different encounters that you might get when people see your work for the first time. Well, this, I get complete, two completely different set of reactions. So there's the reactions that I get from people that have never seen the work, and, I get, and there's reactions from people that have actually seen the work. One of the things that I do is that I have events. Now in a pandemic, I don't, but you know, I had 14 events pre-pandemic where I would show the work to an audience. And what, the way I would do it, you know, trying to keep it digital is I would show it on a flat screen TV in front of an audience and show it in a slideshow type of format. And I would do some readings of what I've written about the project before the, the show of the photographs. I would have a woman read what some of the, the models have written about the project because they've written quite a bit about the project as well. And um, then I would show the, the photos and then we do a, you know, a 90 minute sort of Q and A afterwards. And so the reaction of people that have seen the work has been uh, embarrassingly positive. <laughs> people have almost uh, a religious experience um, because they really connect with the work and people cry and people just say amazing things and they tell their stories. It's almost, 
it reminds me, I mean, I grew up in the church and, you know, it reminds me of people sort of getting up and testifying about what, you know, the Lord has done for them. Um, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I've never seen someone that looks like me, you know, be photographed this way. And seeing this makes me feel like this or makes me feel like that. Or I love the way that the people are smiling. I'm so happy. I love the way that there's no sense of shame. I love seeing older people being photographed. I love seeing, um, and just the diversity. I, you know, I'm very into body positivity and diversity. I am being the rebel on that theme. I am unlike 90% of photographers. 90% of the photographers that are in the nude world are obsessed with photographing skinny 20 year old white women with their ribs showing. And that's 90% of the nude photography that you'll see uh, out there. And it's almost all, always in black and white as well. And you know, the women are posed like they're statues. They're, you know, they're always in the same sort of 22 poses. And so when people see in color, people in their own homes, you know, that you know, have these supposedly imperfect bodies, enjoying themselves and enjoying other people so thoroughly uh, with such abandon, um, they, they love it, um, frankly. Um, but I get a different set of reactions from people that have not seen the work, but are just reacting to me or just the idea of the project. So for a lot of people, having you know, a straight black man who has no fame or no fortune doing this kind of work uh, rubs them the wrong way. In some ways, I'm surprised that I'm still alive. It de definitely rankles some people, just people like me don't traditionally belong in this kind of space. I, you know, I've not met any other photographers of color that are doing the kind of work that I'm doing. And, I, and that's sad for me. I wish I had some, you know, some, some people to, you know, link up with. Um, I have spoken to other photographers that are doing similar work and some of them are doing you know, great work, but they're all white males. Um, I, I've, I, there's only actually been one that I met that's, that's a woman. Um, you know, I haven't had people, other people of color. So it's some people that have a reaction just for me being black and straight and a, and a, and a male and an outsider. Some people, um, of course, just have a problem with the subject matter they would be more comfortable actually probably with porn than with authentic, healthy sexuality because porn has an established place in our, in our society. I mean, even the Romans were quite into porn. They painted pornographic frescoes in their homes. Um, uh, porn has a long tradition and it has, you know, it has its role. Um, but uh, so some people, are more comfortable with seeing sex if there's a connotation of it being dirty. <laughs> um, to see it so straight up is something a lot of people may not be used to. Well, yeah, I think that's the interesting thing. It, it, is, a, it is a taboo subject, right? That's how you would typically define it. I think, yeah, porn is that dirty secret that has kind of gone mainstream and, you know, acceptable but non-acceptable. And I think what you're doing is showing something very natural, very beautiful, and presenting it in a way that is probably utterly disarming for someone who hasn't seen that before. And so you will get a very visceral, instinctive reaction to it. And I think that's what completely fascinates me with your work and the journey that you've been on because you are shining that light on something that is a universal theme that is almost universally what's the best way to describe it it's it's there but it's not there it's you know and it's and it's and I think it could be a, it's and, and I well that's probably why it's challenging why it's challenging for you to sort of bring into the world, challenging to distribute, challenging to sort of talk about in a way, unless you've probably experienced it firsthand, it's probably very difficult to get your head around because how do you even begin to describe it? So, you know, as one of the longest standing members of the Sense Network, uh, you really were one of the early adopters. As I thought we found, found each other out there in the ether 
is there anything that we could be doing? Is there a question? Could we be hosting a, a, a meetup, putting some questions out there, getting you some feedback on your work? You know, tell us, tell us where sort of tell me, tell us where you're where you're currently at in your latest project. Yeah, I mean, the latest project is just starting. And every time I start a new project, you know, it's a search. I have to search sort of within myself to see where I am in my own evolution as, a, as an artist and as a human being. It's also sort of just figuring out where I am in relation to the culture at large. You know, we're in a strange time to be wanting to do an intimacy project at a time where people are afraid of connecting, even on a simple <laughs> level. Um, I have friends whose own family members will only wave to them from the door or wave to them, you know, from the driveway. Um, but they haven't even been able to hug, you know, their loved ones in a long, long time. Even myself, um, I've got an eight-year-old who lives on the other side of the country that I've not seen in a year and a half because of the pandemic. Um, it's a strange time. And, and so I think... Um, it's a challenge, but I think it's, it's maybe a good time to, to do work about connection and intimacy and, and, and love. So I'm still sort of formulating all of that, but I've started shooting and um, I've got the crazy idea that I can finish this first intimacy book, you know, within the year. God knows where we're going. Uh, I'm doubtful at this point, the pandemic is going to be mostly resolved by the end of this year. I, I'm not seeing that happening, but I could be wrong. And maybe I, yeah, I hope I am wrong, but I just don't see that. So, um, you know, how do I, you know, pull this off? I don't know, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my thing. And as far as um, the Sense Network, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, on two levels, one is... Feedback is always interesting for me. So if it was possible, I'd love to uh, show some of the images and you know get feedback from people on, on what they see and what they feel and whatever. But more importantly, or as importantly, I'm wanting to sort of you know reach out and try and find new ways to get the work seen. I often feel guilty about having done this work and it mostly being unseen. Um, I'd like more people to see it. So whether it means being able to network with publicists or network with, you know, people that are into promoting, you know, on the internet and also in the real world, whatever it, whatever it means, I definitely have to figure out ways of getting this work out there because it deserves to be out there and um, the network um, could help, I think. Well, I think maybe the, the next step we should, uh, we could do a private view. How's that? That sounds great. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Um, that has been, thank you so much for sharing that journey. That was just amazing to hear your full story. And I learned a whole bunch of new things um, from listening to that. So thank you very much, Ricardo. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, an absolute pleasure. This brings us to the end of a mind-expanding conversation with Ricardo. Think about what you've heard and what it means to you. Does it leave a lasting impression? Do you have feedback, advice, or a perspective to share with Ricardo? Ideas for a new way to get his work seen? Connections to publicists or promoters on the internet? Please join the conversation at the Sense Network. We will be back soon with another extreme, non-mainstream, possibly uncomfortable conversation from the edge of culture. Thank you for listening to Extreme Perspectives from the Sense Network. We'd love to know what you think, so leave us a comment. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends. In the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram, at the Sense Network. And if you are a misfit, rebel, or a crazy one, and want to collaborate with us, join the Sense Network, linked in the description. We look forward to the next time.